call this hearing to, uh, to order. It's good to see uh, each and every one of you. Today, we're pleased to welcome back uh, five, five members who currently serve on the Nuclear Regulatory uh, Commission, or the NRS, NRC, to uh, discuss uh, President Biden's fiscal year 2024 budget proposal for the commission. Uh, Chair Hansen, uh, Commissioner Barron, Commissioner Wright, Commissioner Caputo, and uh, Commissioner Crowell, uh, welcome. We're uh, delighted to see you, and thank you all for being uh, here with us. Thank you for your willingness to serve in these uh, important roles. And uh, it's great to see you again. We uh, are happy to spend this time with, with all of you. Uh, and particularly, it's, it's uh, great to see Mr. Caputo and Mr. Crow, uh, who join us, I think, for the first time since their confirmation uh, last, uh, last year to fill two vacancies on the commission. We know that a full complement of five commissioners allows the NRC to carry out its responsibilities, considerable responsibilities, to the American people uh, effectively, and we hope that you are settling in uh, nicely. Um, we also appreciate that all five of you were able to join us today because it's important to hear directly from each one of, of, of you. Uh, many of us on this uh, committee want to ensure that the NRC, NRC that has the uh, resources that it needs to maintain the safety of existing uh, nuclear facilities and uh, those that we might build in the future. This includes uh, the work uh, required to develop and deploy the next generation of reactors, as well as new advanced nu nuclear technology and, and materials. As uh, num may maybe most of you know, uh, I believe that safe uh, nuclear power plays a central role in, in our efforts to address the greatest challenge of our time, and that's the climate uh, crisis. I felt this way a long time ago since I was an ensign in the Navy, and I still feel that, uh, that way. America's uh, nuclear reactors provide, uh, I'm told, about a fifth of our nation's electricity and roughly half of all emission-free energy uh, in our country. It's no secret that I believe uh, nuclear energy is key to reaching uh, net zero emissions economy-wide, and the NRC is critical critical to ensuring that our nuclear energy is safe and reliable. From my uh, conversations with members of the commission, it's clear that the NRC is hard at work developing a new regulatory structure for the next generation of nuclear power. This new uh, structure is moving us closer to making advanced nuclear power reality in this country and doing so without jeopardizing safety. And the, uh, the NRC is not only on time to deliver a, a new framework for licensing advanced reactors, but ahead of schedule, I'm told, when it comes to meeting your statutory requirements. In addition, I applaud the NRC's uh, recent decision on fusion regulation, which provides a path forward for the deployment of this technology. Going forward, this will help uh, give fusion developers the regulatory certainty that they need to innovate while also protecting safety, security, and public health. Still, it's been uh, difficult for the NRC to operate under the constraints that the Nuclear uh, Energy Innovation Modernization Act requires. Last Congress, uh, NRC Chair uh, Hansen testified for our committee. And during that time, he expressed concerns about the impact of budgetary caps on the agency's abilities to hire the workforce of the future and take on the challenges of licensing and advanced uh, nuclear uh, technology. That's why I joined uh, Senator uh, uh, Capito and Senator Whitehouse to introduce uh, the Accelerating Deployment of Versatile Advanced Nuclear for Clean Energy, or uh, ADVANCE Act. Our bipartisan legislation includes provisions that would help uh, ease uh, these restrictive budget caps that Chair Hansen uh, mentioned previously. Uh, the ADVANCE uh, Act would also help ensure that uh, the NRC has the uh, best tools and highly trained staff that it needs to keep up with the speed of innovation and the growing interest in nuclear energy. And further, if uh, we want the U.S. nuclear industry to be successful, we need to invest in its future. And that means investing in the nuclear industry's workforce. Almost every organization needs a strong and dedicated workforce if they're going to be successful, and the NRC is no exception to that. As we advance the next uh, generation of nuclear technologies, we must also ensure that the NRC has adequate funding to attract and retain the best and brightest talent needed to license and regulate new technologies. The NRC remains the global, mobile, uh, the, the global model 
for uh, nuclear safety uh, agencies. I'm proud of that, and I'm sure you are too. Commission's work uh, to uh, maintain safe and secure nuclear power is an essential tool in our efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Today, we look forward to discussing how President Biden's proposed budget for the fiscal year 2024 will impact the decisions that the NRC makes now and ultimately the future of the, uh, the agency for years to, to come. Before we hear uh, from our witnesses, let me first turn to our ranking member, Senator Capito, for her opening remarks. Senator Capito. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank all of you for being here. It is nice to see a full compliment. And uh, it's good to see uh, you, uh, Ms. Caputo, because, Commissioner Caputo, because my first visit to a nuclear plant was with you, so it's, we've, we've been around the bend on this. So great to see you. Uh, since our last Nuclear Regulatory Commission oversight hearing 16 months ago, uh, major events, both here and abroad, make clear the urgent need for the United States to lead in civil nuclear energy. The first nucle nuclear unit at Southern Company's Vogel site in Georgia went critical recently, and it is now connected to the electric grid and is on the brink of commencing commercial operation. This is the first commercial nuclear uh, reactor in a generation, and I think it's a major achievement for America's nuclear industry. It's also the first nuclear reactor designed to be fully developed, licensed, and constructed since Congress established the uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission nearly 50 years ago. Advanced nuclear Advanced reactor development is progressing as numerous states pursue the deployment of advanced nuclear technologies, including my home state of West Virginia. West Virginia is assessing options to deploy nuclear energy, building on our state's proud legacy of serving as a leading energy provider. While we reinvigorate our domestic nuclear sector, global events necessitate that America really reasserts our international leadership here. Russia's war in Ukraine reinforces the fact that energy security is synonymous with national security. Russia sought to use Europe's reliance on Russian natural gas to destabilize our allies' resolve to support Ukraine. Instead, we expedited export shipments of Americans' LNG to our European friends and increased uh, energy cooperation. It is also reported that Rose Adam, Russian's state-backed nuclear company, is actively supporting the war. Every dollar that goes to Rose Adam is helping Putin and Russia. And Russia has been aggressive in trying to gain political leverage and commercial footholds through the export of its nuclear technologies, services, and fuels abroad. Meanwhile, our government alongside American companies is working to counter Russia's strategic nuclear engagement by building relationships with nations around the world to construct U.S. reactor technology. Doing so will establish a decade-long partnerships in the nuclear supply chain, the use of advanced nuclear fuels, and reactor operations. U.S. companies have already entered into agreements with Romania, Poland, and the Czech Republic, just to name a few. These circumstances dictate that America can and should lead in nuclear energy development. Central to realizing the opportunities for new nuclear here and in foreign markets is an, effect, is an effective dis, d, domestic nuclear safety regulator, you all. <laughs> Should have just made that a briefer statement there. This is why I recently introduced the ADVANCE Act with nine co-sponsors, as the chairman spoke about, including Chairman Carper and also Senator Whitehouse. And we're picking up sponsors, we hope. The bill facilitates greater international engagement by the uh, NRC and other fe federal agencies to help win the geostrategic nuclear energy competition. This will uh, position our American businesses to better compete with Russia and Chinese nuclear companies. This bill helps states like mine, like West Virginia, pursue advanced nuclear technologies by reducing regulatory costs and providing regulatory certainty. The bill assists the NRC in efficiently fulfilling its core nuclear safety mission with expert staff in a predictable and timely manner. And while we look to provide the commission additional direction and authority, Congress needs to be also carefully consider how the agency is functioning. That's why we're here today. So this morning, we will hear the NRC chair and the commissioners regarding the fiscal year 2024 proposed budget. While the current amount of work the NRC is conducting for its core licensing and regulatory oversight purpose is down, the commission is asking for significant new funding in part to prepare for potential licensing work for new reactors. The NRC's budget 
must become more efficient in order to be ready for that anticipated workload. Last year, this mystifies me, we'll have to get into this, the commission did not spend more than $90 million of its allotted funding. That means 10% of the, of the NRC's total budget authority went unspent. I do appreciate that the commission is proposing to apply some of that uh, carry-over funding, carry funding to this year's bu uh, budget request. However, when much of the commission's budget is funded by regulated utilities and ultimately electric rate payers, the commission should not, I don't believe, ca be carrying over large balances from year to year. Just as important as finding efficiencies in the NRC's management of its money uh, is also how the NRC can, is addressing and can perform its licensing and regulatory oversight work more efficiently as well. In January, I requested information regarding the Commission's telework policy and the number of staff that are regularly in the office. And thank you for coming to my office and presenting that report. Nearly 60% of the workforce is in the office fewer than three days per week. I am concerned that the expansion of and reliance upon remote work will have unforeseen negative consequences on operational deficiency. The NRC is, is predicting annual attrition rates of 7% for the next three to five years. In my view, it is imperative that workforce development programs enable the new staff to work side by side with experienced staff to see firsthand how the commission's work is performed and to pass along known best practices. Significant reliance on telework and video calls, I believe, will hamper the ability of the staff to efficiently review and approve licensed applications. NRC's workload and associated challenges uh, with licensing multiple first-of-its-kind advanced reactors during this next decade is so significant. Congress has appropriated billions of dollars to facilitate the development of advanced nuclear reactors, and therefore timely and effective regulatory review is essential. All five of the commissioners recently spoke to the NRC's ability to meet the moment and successfully realize the bipartisan congressional support for advanced nuclear policy. Congress must ensure that the moment is not missed, along with you all. Since the NRC's establishment, a series of reports have consistently identified deficiency in the NRC's work. For example, about 30 years ago, two reports, the T Towers Perrin and the Center for Strategic and International Studies reports, identified major shortcomings in the NRC's effectiveness and posture. The NRC responded to those reports at the time by successfully repositioning the commission to respond to the dynamic changes that are facing the nuclear industry. To enable the NRC to effectively carry out its foundational Atomic Energy Act charge, and in light of the forthcoming licensing work, it may be time to undertake another comprehensive analysis to ensure that the commission and our nation is well positioned to deploy the new generation of nuclear designs. I look forward to further conversation and appreciate you all coming in today. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Senator Capito. Uh, we're now going to turn to uh, our panel of uh, uh, witnesses and to welcome you all back uh, before us. Uh, we are grateful uh, that you're joining us uh, today. Uh, grateful that you're willing to serve in this important capacity. And uh, we look forward to what, uh, what you have to, uh, to say. Uh, we're going to lead off with uh, our chair, uh, Chris Hansen. And uh, uh, we're going to ask you to use about five minutes in your remarks. And then we'll turn to uh, your colleagues on the commission and ask each of you to, to speak for roughly two minutes. But start off, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, you're recognized. Please proceed. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chairman Carper and Ranking Member Capito, uh, Senator Stabenow. Uh, it's it's uh, good to be with you all this morning. Uh, my colleagues and I very much appreciate the opportunity to discuss uh, the, the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission's fiscal year 2024 budget request and update you on some of the agency's licensing and oversight activities. The NRC is an independent federal agency established to regulate commercial nuclear power plants, research and test reactors, nuclear fuel cycle facilities, and radioactive materials used in medicine, academia, and industry. The agency also regulates the transportation, uh, storage, and disposal of radioactive materials and waste, the import and export of radioactive materials, nuclear reactors, and fuel cycle facilities, and the export of nuclear facility components. The NRC's FY24 budget request is $1 billion to support activities focusing on the safety and security of the facilities and materials that we regulate. The budget request represents about a 6.7% increase, or $63.2 million, over the NRC's enacted budget for FY 2023. 
This is primarily to support increased salaries and benefits in, according with the, in accordance with the U.S. Office of Management and Budget Guidance and workload changes. The budget request proposes to use $27.1 million in carryover to offset the nuclear reactor safety budget, resulting in an adjusted gross budget authority of $979 million. The NRC expects to recover $832 million of the FY24 budget from fees assessed to NRC licensees. This will result in a net appropriation of $156 million, which is an increase of $19 million when compared to the FY23 budget. The FY24 budget request is, in, is anticipated to encompass the regulation of 94 operating power reactors, 31 non-power production or utilization facilities, 23 power reactor sites undergoing decommissioning, and thousands of other facilities and materials that we regulate. The NRC realized a number of important accomplishments over the last year and made progress in key areas. To highlight a few, Senator Capito, as you noted, um, the NRC authorized the operation of Vogel Unit 3 in Georgia, marking the first time the agency has authorized fuel loading and startup operations for a nuclear power plant with a combined construction, and, uh, construction permit and operating license. In another major achievement, the NRC completed New Scales design certification for its small modular reactor. And the agency also renewed the license for Westinghouse's fuel fabrication facility in Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, I think Senator Carper and Senator Capito, you both noted uh, that the commission uh, recently took a major step in clarifying the regulation of fusion energy in the United States by directing the staff to license near-term fusion energy systems under a byproduct material framework. I'd like to now highlight some specific elements of the NRC's FY24 budget request. The NRC's nuclear reactor safety program encompasses licensing and oversight of civilian nuclear power reactors and non-power facilities. The FY24 budget request for nuclear reactor safety program is $530.8 million. A portion of this budget request, about $34 million, is, off -fee, is from off-fee based funds would support the development of advanced reactor regulatory infrastructure and staff capabilities for licensing of advanced nuclear reactor and fuel cycle technologies. The operating reactor portion of this request will support licensing and inspection. With the inclusion of the carryover used to offset the FY24 budget request, the NRC is requesting a total of 425.8 uh, million within this. The portion of the budget request designated for new reactors is 105 million. In addition to the development of the new regulatory licensing framework, this request supports numerous pre-application activities as well as resources for technical reviews associated with several licensing activities for advanced reactors. The Nuclear Materials and Waste Safety Program is responsible for licensing, regulating, and overseeing uranium process and fuel facilities, research and pilot facilities, and other nuclear materials licensees. The FY24 budget request for the Nuclear Materials and Waste Safety Program is $153 million. The NRC's corporate support business line includes a wide range of necessary functions critical to the agency's work. The FY24 budget request of $304 million would comprise 30.2% of the NRC's total requested budget, which reflects the agency's efforts to comply with the corporate support cap mandated by the Nuclear Energy Innovation and Modernization Act to the maximum extent practicable. In closing, the FY24 budget request allows NRC to focus on conducting our mission activities to ensure the safety and security of nuclear power facilities and nuclear materials. On behalf of the Commission, I thank you for the opportunity to discuss the important work we anticipate in the year ahead and for your support of the NRC's vital mission. We'd be pleased to respond to your questions. <clears throat> Thanks, Thanks, Mr. Chairman. And now, uh, Jeff Barron, go ahead. Commissioner Barron, you're recognized. Well, Two minutes. Thank, Two minutes, thank you. Please. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. It's great to be back with my colleagues to discuss NRC's budget. It's an exciting time to be doing our important work with more potential applications for advanced reactors, small modular reactors, subsequent license renewal, new fuel designs, power up rates, and risk-informed programs expected. NRC's overall workload is increasing. Our budget request is structured to allow us to take on this new work. NRC has a key role to play in tackling climate change. It's our job to ensure the safety and security of nuclear power in the U.S. energy mix. When utilities and vendors tell us that we should expect numerous new designs and reactor applications, we need to be ready with sufficient resources and the right expertise to review them and an efficient and effective licensing process that can handle whatever volume comes our way. 
That's an important NRC responsibility. So NRC is busy preparing the regulatory framework for advanced reactors and small modular reactors. At the same time, the NRC staff is reviewing applications that have already been submitted. For the operation of existing nuclear power plants now and into the future, NRC's job is to provide strong safety and security standards and rigorous independent oversight. In this period of change, NRC needs to be open to and ready for new technologies that could improve safety, whether it's digital instrumentation and control, accident tolerant fuels, sensors, advanced manufacturing techniques, or artificial intelligence. We need to establish a reliable regulatory framework for reviewing these technologies while ensuring that they are adopted safely without introducing any unacceptable risks. As NRC does its work, the agency is focused on its workforce. We're facing a significant hiring challenge. We have a large number of employees who are eligible for retirement. With higher employee attrition, the agency's efforts on external hiring are crucial. Significant external hiring is necessary for the agency to do the work we have in front of us now and to be ready for the work coming our way. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank, thank you, um, Commissioner Barron. Uh, Commissioner Wright, please. Two minutes, please. Just make your remarks on. I'm sorry. Thank you so much. We want to hear every word. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much, Chairman Carper and Ranking Member Capito and Senator Stabenow um, and the other honorable members of the committee. Um, thank you for the opportunity to appear today. Um, this is a very short chair. I'm, I'm already vertically challenged as it is. So, um, <laughs> so this is an exciting time for the commission. The policy decisions that we have in front of us will play a pivotal role and shaping the energy future of this country, as well as beyond our borders. And I'm honored to be a part of that process. By working together, the five of us can help meet the moment uh, in time to enable the safe use of nuclear technologies while we continue to meet our mission of reasonable assurance of adequate protection of public health and safety and to promote the common defense and security and to protect the environment. On behalf of me and my team, I want to thank my colleagues and their staffs for their willingness to work together on important issues before us, such as advanced reactors, accident tolerant fuel, fusion, uh, cleanup of legacy uranium mines, and spent fuel storage, just to name a few. I'm also grateful to the NRC staff, who are truly some of the smartest and the most talented people that I've ever been around. They do an outstanding job of monitoring the day-to-day -day, uh, safety of our nuclear facilities, and I want to take this moment to thank them publicly. Uh, going forward, I look forward to the continued excellent support and insights that they provide us. And with that, I look forward to your question. Thanks, uh, Commissioner Wright. Uh, Commissioner uh, Caputo. <clears throat> Good morning. Thank you, Chairman Carper, Ranking Member Capito, and members of the committee for the opportunity to come before you today. This committee has demonstrated strong bipartisan support for, the, for advanced nuclear reactors and a sense of urgency driven by both climate change and energy security concerns. NRC's role as gatekeeper to the future of advanced reactors is a role that we must get right. While the primacy of our mission to protect public health and safety and security and the environment is indisputable, we must find ways to innovate how we will regulate advanced reactors to allow safe nuclear energy deployment on a scale warranted by our national and global clean energy needs. Congress directed the NRC to develop a new regulatory framework for advanced reactors. The proposed rule under consideration by the Commission is a complex 1,200-page undertaking. This will require considerable work on the part of my colleagues and I to meet Congress's intent with a sense of urgency. I pledge to work collegially with my fellow commissioners to shape a framework that is simpler reflecting the inherent safety found in advanced designs and enabling predictable, efficient reviews. Our principles of good regulation state that the American taxpayer, the rate-paying consumer, and licensees are all entitled to the best possible management and administration of our regulatory activities. At the end of fiscal year 22, as Senator Capito mentioned, the agency had a carryover balance of $92 million. This means the agency collected roughly $58 million from licensees and $34 million from taxpayers that we did not need to fulfill our mission. I share the committee's concern that the agency be adequately resourced and staffed to meet our mission. However, my longstanding view remains that the agency needs to improve its financial stewardship of its resources and the fairness of fees billed to licensees and applicants. I look forward to working with Chairman Hansen and my fellow commissioners to, uh, to improve that issue. Thank you. 
Yeah, thank you uh, so, so much. And now we're going to hear from uh, Brad Crowell and uh, for uh, also for two minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Carper, Ranking Member Capito, <clears throat> and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to, te to testify today. Since taking office last year, I've had the pleasure of building positive working relationships with my fellow commissioners. It's been apparent that a genuine spirit of collegiality among the commission forms the foundation for successfully executing the NRC's mission with maximum effectiveness and efficiency. Strong collegiality is further advanced when operating with the full complement of commissioners. With five commissioners since last August, the commission has made progress on pivotal issues related to the existing reactor fleet while also forging ahead on establishing respons a responsible <coughs> regulatory framework to support the next generation of nuclear technologies. Chair Hansen highlighted these topics in his testimony and many other notable recent accomplishments, while also emphasizing the robust work schedule ahead for fiscal year 2024 and beyond. The NRC has a central role to play in the future viability of nuclear energy, both in the US and abroad. As the nation's regulator for the safe and secure operation of civilian nuclear technologies, the NRC is committed to ensuring the public can have confidence that all NRC licensees operate in a manner that minimizes risk and maximizes safety. The foundational mission of the NRC must always be the uncompromising protection of public health, safety, security, and the environment. But that mission can no longer be applied to the narrow lens that has been used in past decades at the, decades at the NRC. The NRC must quickly adapt to embrace the shared responsibility of our nation's collective effort to address climate change and energy security. The potential for nuclear energy to make a meaningful and enduring contribution to reducing carbon emissions and stabilizing our energy grid is real, but in doing so, time is of the essence and there is much to accomplish across the full NRC mission space. To be successful, the NRC must embrace a contemporary sense of purpose that embodies the challenges and opportunities before us. As an essential part of this effort, the NRC must restore, build, and maintain public trust through proactive and meaningful interactions with the public, other government agencies, and the full spectrum of, sp of stakeholders. The NRC must also maintain a, co a commitment to safely regulating the full fuel cycle by asserting commensurate focus on issues from mining to waste in its regulatory decisions and research activities. Proactive engagement on used fuel management, decommissioning, and waste disposal is critical to enhancing public confidence. I'm excited by the challenge of what we can and must accomplish by the end of this decade, but we must get to work now and maintain this level of commitment in subsequent years to succeed. I'm confident the NRC staff is up to the challenge. The FY24 budget request is an important step, next step to ensure that we have the resources necessary to meet this pivotal moment. Thank you, I look forward to your questions. Thank you, uh, thank you all for those uh, comments. I'm gonna uh, turn to uh, back to Chairman uh, Hanson for uh, uh, first, uh, first couple of questions. The NRC's uh, work to uh, maintain the safety and security of our nation's nuclear power facilities and materials is critical to ensuring that nuclear energy uh, remain, uh, remains an important part of our clean energy supply. Unfortunately, the Nuclear Energy Innovation Modernization Act, uh, affectionately known as NEMA, which was signed into law in January of 2019, placed limitations on the NRC's uh, administrative an administrative cost uh, known as corporate support. To fix this, uh, I worked with the ranking member uh, Cap Capito on language, and our staffs worked together, on language uh, included in the Advance Act that would ease these restrictive caps with the goal of providing greater flexibility for the NRC to ensure that it has the best tools and the, the workforce that's required. Uh, would you take a, a, a moment or two to describe for us how easing these corporate support restraints will support the NRC's efforts to modernize and hire the highly skilled workers needed to carry out the NRC's important work, uh, both now and well into the future. Go right ahead. Senator Cap, uh, Chairman Carper, thank you um, very much for that question. And I appreciate the committee's um, focus on corporate support in the, in the Advanced Act. Um, I, continued focus on our overhead costs and uh, keeping those down to the maximum extent practicable is um, is some, certainly something um, we're continuing to do and 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 we will do um, uh, into the future um, what we've proposed in the FY 24 budget is is a, a, a couple of modest adjustments really in the area of um, HR um, we've undertaken um, an effort to uh, hire staff um, hire the right staff um, up to our authorized levels, and we need some additional uh, corporate support resources in order to be able um, uh, to do that. I, I would note that 
Um, the corporate support request in this budget is, uh, is right around $300 million. So as I said, about 30%. Um, that is actually 30, that is $30 million less than the FY16 level and actually adjusted for inflation, it's about $120 million less than FY16. So we have brought these costs down and we're going to continue to focus on that um, uh, as part of our uh, efforts. Additionally, um, uh, a 1% reduction in corporate support then on a billion dollars is roughly about $10 million and that uh, equates you know, to as many as um, uh, anywhere, depending on contracting costs and other kinds of things, as many as, as um, 30 to 50 full-time uh, uh, positions. And those are people that we really need to be able to hire people, bring them on board, vet them for security, make sure they've got the IT resources and other kinds of things that they need. So um, modest relief in the corporate support area is really critical to our ability to hire folks. Back in 2021, we had about 180 hiring actions, but only about 100 of those were external. In 22, we, um, we had about 200 external uh, hiring actions, and that requires a lot of additional resources to bring folks into, in, not a lot, a modest amount of additional resources to bring folks into the government. Um, we, also law, we also, through attrition, uh, had 250 people lead the agency. So actually, at the end of 22, we were still down about 40 positions agency-wide. So you can see the we're trying to bring people in, even as um, I think uh, a number of people noted our workforce is, is aging and we're trying to um, uh, get our arms around, around this uh, staffing uh, issue to accomplish the mission. Well, you're not the, uh, the only uh, uh, entities trying to get their arms around the staffing issues. Uh, we, uh, Senator Capito, my colleagues and I have uh, returned from, on Monday from two-week recess, and uh, I suspect that they did uh, something similar to what I did. I, I covered my state from one end to the other. It's easier in Delaware because we're only like 100 miles from north to south and about 50 miles wide. But uh, we visited businesses large and small, and we'd, uh, uh, our congressional delegation would ask really three questions of the businesses that, we, that we'd visit, like, how are you doing? business, how are you doing? We'd say, how are we doing congressional delegation, uh, federal government, state government, and what can we do to help? And on the third question, uh, almost without exception, the response to what can we do to help is we just need people come to work. Uh, we need people come to work who are trained or trainable and will do a day's work for a day's pay. We heard that again and again and again. Uh, and as, uh, I, I said that as a, as a back, little background, but, but as the NRC looks to recruit the, uh, the best and the brightest, uh, what has been critical in what has been critical in attracting and training a workforce that's able to, uh, to understand today's technology and the technology of the future. What more could, could we do uh, to help uh, at the, uh, the, con at the, on the congressional side, uh, help uh, you and the, uh, the NRC attract and retain the, the kind of uh, talent that's required? Yeah. Uh, Senator, thank you. The, the authorities provided, the additional authorities provided in the Advance Act will certainly uh, help with that. Um, uh, workplace flexibilities, um, I think, will uh, also continue to help. We have we face stiff competition from other government agencies and from industry, and so being able to offer um, uh, some level of of telework um, is important. And I, you know, was, uh, Commissioner Caputo mentioned the strong bipartisan support of this committee for nuclear. Uh, I think is also important because that that shows um, that uh, this. Industry is is getting a lot of attention, and I think that's uh, good for us. When I go out and talk to people, I emphasize the mission of the NRC, the the safety mission, and the importance of public service. And that uh, maybe it's not something that folks will want to go do for their entire career, but to go and serve their country for a period of time and and help us uh, ensure the safety and security of of these advanced technologies and of the current fleet is a is a a, a good and and uh, noble calling. All right, thank you. Just, just as an aside, I mentioned uh, um, my uh, uh, experience with the, with the Navy. Uh, I was in the airplanes, airplanes chasing submarines, nuclear submarines. But um, the uh, we have a, a Dover Air Force Base, which is in, uh, just outside of Dover, Delaware, in the middle of the part of our state. Uh, about every uh, every week, they uh, they hold a, a, a forum. They call it transition assistance uh, program. And uh, for people that are timing out, they're going to retire. They're going to move from active duty to reserve duty. 
But um, we didn't have anything like that when I timed out at, at the Navy at the end of the Vietnam War. But um, there's a, a, a considerable workforce coming off the Dover Air Force Base. We have like five, 6,000 people who work there, civilian and, and otherwise. And um, so that, that provides actually a fertile uh, field, if you will, supply of, of employees. The, uh, the, there's a lot of people who are in the nuclear Navy. And uh, some of them do stay for a career. Some stay for 10, 20, 30 years, as you know. Some don't. And some of them become reservists and, and all. I just, uh, do, you, do you ever take a look at uh, working with the Navy? It says people in uniform time out from their nuclear uh, Navy and to see if they might be appropriate in working for when with uh, the NRC. We are, we are doing that. We have about 25% of our workforce that are uh, uh, military veterans. Most of those uh, from the Navy and the nuclear Navy. We've been great beneficiaries of that program over time in the agency. Good. I find when I visit, uh, visit nuclear power plants, a lot of the folks who work at nuclear power plants are yeah. folks with uh, Navy nuclear experience. Um, this is a, a question for the entire uh, panel. We'll start uh, with you, uh, Commissioner Barron. But uh, the Nuclear Energy Innovation Modernization Act requires NRC to develop a regulatory framework for the next generation of nuclear technologies. Uh, we want to see a regulatory framework that is risk-informed, uh, performance-based, and technology neutral. And importantly, this framework needs to be both workable and usable to help us deploy more safe and reliable nuclear energy. And here's my question for, for uh, the entire panel, starting with you, Mr. Barron. Could each of you uh, please take a brief moment and tell us how the new regulatory framework development process is going and how what is going well and are there any issues of concern you'd like to bring to us, Commissioner Barron? Well, thanks for the question. It's, it's something we're obviously all very focused on. Um, I think we're all uh, reviewing and, and beginning to digest the draft proposed rule. And I agree with you completely. We, it, the result needs to be an efficient and effective licensing framework going forward. I think uh, we've heard throughout this process as the staffs develop the, the draft proposed rule, um, there are several issues we hear about a lot from a lot of stakeholders, um, concerns or areas where it's clear that the commission is going to need to make a decision about how to, to proceed. Uh, everything from, you know, we're going to have a performance-based regulation. What is the overall performance standard? What should it be? There's, uh, there's a debate about that. There's a question about, um, you know, our, the role of as low as reasonable achievable doses. How does that play into how, how does that play in? Um, do we have two frameworks, a framework A and a framework B? Uh, and if so, how does, how does framework B look? Security, there's multiple big issues, uh, but probably a half dozen or so that probably get the most attention from stakeholders, and I think that the staff has spent the most time on. So I know we'll always we'll all be focused on those issues and trying to figure out how do we strike the right balance, how do we have a, a good rule in the end that's going to work and be uh, efficient and effective. All right, thanks. My, uh, my time has expired. I'm going to come back and, and pick this up but as, after I reach my colleagues have had a chance to, uh, to ask uh, uh, their, their questions. But so let me review right now to Senator Capito, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all. Uh, Chair Hanson, I wanted to ask specifically about the state of West Virginia uh, because uh, West Virginia recently notified the commission of its interest, of its interest becoming an agreement state. Uh, agreement states assume responsibility to exercise certain regulatory authorities over nuclear materials. And it, it has a process, and you all uh, review that. Uh, in your letter to our governor, Governor Justice, you welcomed the state's interest, and I appreciate that. So I, I, I would just ask for your assurance that uh, you will provide all the necessary attention and resources to help review that uh, application that West Virginia has made, as well, well as frequent communications with the state as we're going through this process. Uh, yes, uh, Senator, you have my commitment with that. The process really kicks off on June 1st, and that's going to be followed by a series of, of monthly status meetings between the state and NRC staff. And not only will we be reviewing their application, but we're going to provide training uh, um, to state staff on uh, on for them to get up to speed on being materials, you know, reviewing materials licenses and becoming inspectors. Right. I mean, for our state, this is new territory for us. That's very helpful. Um, how many states have state agreements already? 
Uh, we have 39 uh, fully in place. We have two okay. more in process, actually. Okay. West Virginia is going to be joining Indiana and Connecticut, who are in the middle of that process right okay. now. All right, thank you. Um, there's already been a lot of conversation about uh, what uh, is known, I guess, as Part 53, the new regulation, the 1,800 pages uh, that have come forth for a uh, regulatory framework for advanced nuclear reactor technologies. Uh, you know, I think this is uh, absolutely essential. Uh, it's come to our attention, and Commissioner Barron, I think you just mentioned this, that stakeholders have ad been consistently identifying some key issues where they have some, some um, uh, issues that need to be resolved before the final rule, I guess, would, would move forward. Um, so, you know, you want a rule that's workable. I mean, we're, we're really putting a lot of eggs in this basket here uh, to be able to move forward, not just here, but as I mentioned in my opening statement, uh, globally. So I just want a simple yes and no response from all of you that uh, you, you agree, obviously, I think, that a successful regulatory framework must be a rule that can be used, but will you commit to addressing the wi widely acknowledged issues with the proposed rule and provide specific direction to fix those rules? So. If I can just go down the dais, say yes or no on that. Uh, yes, Senator, we'll be tackling those issues. Thank you. Yes, of course. Yes. Yes. Yes, I will. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, before I ask about telework, uh, I want to ask about this uh, 92 million carryover. You mentioned, uh, Chairman, that 21 million of that is carried over. Well, I can do simple math here. That leaves another 71 million. Where does that go? Where is that? If you're only using 21 million in your, to carry over into this year's budget, oh, what? I see the 20. Yeah, the 27 million we've proposed in the F, in oh, the 24 to kind of offset that, right? But that does still leave some uh, additional carryover. We're, I mean, significant. Let me, let, yeah, go ahead. Significant. That's a significant. It's over. I mean, if I'm not seeing this right, it's a 70 million dollar unused still. Is that correct? Close to that? Well, Senator, at about halfway through the year, we've now obligated about half of that $90 million already to new work here in FY23. So you're using that now? So we're using that, yeah. Okay. It doesn't just kind of, a, it doesn't consistently accumulate. We'll take uh, unobligated funds and then dedicate those to um, existing Okay, uh, existing work. Uh, Commis Commissioner Caputo, I'd like you to weigh in here because you mentioned it on your in your statement, how you feel about that method of... Uh, paying for things? I think what the chairman's referring to is spending the older money first, but I also think what that does is that pushes forward the dates where we start using the appropriations that were given for the fiscal year. So it sort of then pushes carry out, carry over through to the end of this fiscal year. So considering that we ended the year with 92 million in carryover and received a budget increase in fiscal 23, I would expect us again to have carryover at least on that order, if not higher. Yeah, and you mentioned that that carryover dollars represents not just the corporate, if I'm saying this correctly, the corporate contribution, but you mentioned rate payers and... Uh, uh, did yes. You, yes. Could yes. you explain what that means? That's the taxpayer, right? The person who's receiving the service. Yes. Um, there's a portion of our budget that's paid for by taxpayers, which is in the neighborhood of 15%, um, and the remainder of it is collected from licensees and applicants. And that uh, what I mentioned in my statement was the breakdown between the activities where we had uh, excess funds that were taxpayer-funded versus those that we, as mandate under law, have to recover in fees. Okay. So when our budget is issued, we have to recover the fees regardless of whether or not we use the money. Okay. All right. Uh, can I ask one more? Can I ask my telework question? Um, Chairman Hansen, I'm, the statistics that, that you generated and that I mentioned in my opening statement, um, I think as you look further into some of that, there's a, a great, a vast majority of, uh, of um, NRC employees that are not in the office six days out of two weeks pay period. Um, I mentioned concerns of mentoring. I mean, we, we see this uh, uh, popping up a lot in corporate America. A lot of people are bringing everybody back. I understand when we had this conversation earlier, my, your response to me was it needs to be an all of government response. In other words, I can't respond at the NRC one way and then have the Department of Energy doing something else because they're gonna pick off my talent is, is the bottom line here. Yeah. 
Do you not do you not agree that to have uh, I know to have a blended work yes but to have more people actually in the office mentoring new employees talking about new technologies that are coming online is a much more effective way to actually get a better result. Um, Senator I definitely agree that there are a lot of advantages of in person interactions and we want those interactions uh, to be pur purposeful we can we we brought the staff back to the office at about 2 days a week just about a year ago now. And what we found was there was a lot of um, uneven distribution about who was in the office when, and folks were sitting in their cubes by themselves on Teams meetings with other people who weren't around. And so what we've tried to do is develop a, a, a model of interacting where people are coming together for a particular reason. Um, and like you said, I think mentoring is a great example of that. Um, uh, celebrating achievements, completing work together on, on, on big efforts. And we're trying to develop a flexible work model that um, uh, directs, encourages, and, and guides that kind of, those kinds of meaningful interactions. Do you make those decisions yourself, or are those made within the agency by the different siloed air areas of, your, of the NRC? Our, our executive director of operations and, and the leadership team of, of career civil servants is, is making those decisions, but they're keeping the commission informed. So it's an all of it's an all of it. It's a it's a consistent policy across the commission. That is that is the idea. Yeah, that, that, it, that it's a consistent policy across the agency. Well, the president made a statement on it the other day, uh, and then he said, "Well, when you come into work, it it has to be for a meaningful purpose." And I was like, uh, "Isn't every day supposed to be a meaningful purpose of work?" <laughs> I mean, I th sort of thought, "Who goes to work for unmeaningful oh, purposes?" I mean, yeah. that, that that sounds sort of wasteful to me. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Senator Kaplan. I think, uh, Senator uh, Stapano, you're next. Welcome. Nice to see you. Thank you. Well, good morning, and thanks to all of you. I hope every, every day is meaningful as we are uh, coming into work together. Thank you for all of your work and leadership. Uh, I'm a, a supporter of the use of nuclear power. I think we do have great new opportunities now, and certainly tackling the climate crisis, uh, using the new technologies that you've been talking about, I think give us some um, real opportunities. I wanted to talk, ask a first question about something close to home in Michigan, and I know Chairman Hansen, as a Michigan native yourself, we're, we're glad to say, um, I know you are well aware of how we feel about our Great Lakes in terms of the economy, our way of life. We like to say the Great Lakes are really in our DNA, and that uh, we do everything we can to protect this unparalleled natural resource for, for the next generations. And so that's why uh, I've, uh, for years now, led efforts working with our Canadian uh, friends uh, to stop proposals to bury high-level nuclear waste in the Great Lakes Basin. Um, we've had meetings, I've had meetings in Canada, in Michigan, phone calls, good conversations. We, the good news is we were successful in stopping one proposal, but unfortunately Canada continues now to consider a separate proposal to store highly ra radioactive waste at a site just off of Lake Huron, and they're only months away from finalizing decision on the matter. Now, I understand they're looking at two sites. One is not in the Great Lakes Basin. One is near Lake Huron. Obviously, we would prefer Canada is a big country, and as I have said to my Canadian friends, you have a lot of options on where you would locate a site. It doesn't have to be right next to the Great Lakes, right next to Lake Huron, and particularly when we talk about threatening the drinking water supply of more than 40 million people in U.S. and Canada, as you know. So my question is, will you commit to work with me, to work with us, work with other federal partners, including the State Department, to engage with our Canadian allies on this issue in an effort, a hopefully successful effort, that this waste will not be permanently stored in the Great Lakes Basin? Uh, Senator, yeah, I commit to work with you and, and the State Department and other, our interagency partners to bring the breadth and depth of the expertise of the NRC to this issue. Great. Well, this is really important, and hopefully as we move forward in tech, new technologies and so on, maybe issues around waste won't be what they are today, but certainly we are very concerned um, about the Great Lakes. I did want to go back to what my uh, leadership of our committee has talked to you about and you've mentioned, but just a little bit more um, on workforce, which is a challenge, of course, for all of us, every business, every entity. 
um, certainly in Michigan and, and uh, in the federal government and so on. But when I learned that one third of the NRC staff is eligible for retirement, it's like, ouch, uh, that's a challenge. That is a very big challenge. A lot of expertise to replace, for sure. And I wondered um, if uh, the chairman, also Commissioner Barron, you spoke about this specifically as well. But when we look at um, what does this mean for your ability to develop and implement standards? Um, you've talked about some strategies. I'm glad you're reaching out to the Navy. My dad was in the Navy as well, as the chairman knows, and uh, uh, in, in reaching out to others. But what else can we do to support you uh, to be able to get you what you need in terms of uh, the expertise that's necessary? Uh. Thank you, uh, Senator, very much. Um, in terms of bringing folks into the agency, we've, we've got a, a broad uh, across the board approach where we're really actively engaging recent, you know, recent college graduates. I'm visiting universities. I know my colleagues are as well um, to try and get folks on the nuclear track and interested in public service. But we're also working hard to um, uh, recruit and retain mid-career folks as well, folks with expertise already that can come in the door and maybe hit the ground running a little bit more. And certainly um, competitive uh, pay and benefits, maybe not everything that industry can do, but certainly the benefits um, uh, that the federal government has there. Um, but also things like uh, student loan repayment and other kinds of federal tools that we might be able to use to uh, retain folks. We also have specific um, uh, uh, um, programs for specific skill sets. It's not just you know folks in general, but we're looking for people like reactor systems analysts or health physicists, and we have specific uh, initiatives aimed at getting those folks in, in the door. Right. Commissioner Barron, would you want to add to that? I, I don't know that I could add too much. I agree with everything uh, Chair Hansen said. I, I would just note kind of for a little bit of context, for a number of years, the agency had been shrinking. We have been doing very little external hiring. And so only these last couple years have we been starting to ramp this up. And because of attrition and growing number of folks um, retiring, we need to hire a couple hundred people a year just to stay flat. And that's much, much more than we had been doing you know, in the last several years. And so um, as, as the chair said, um, the, the folks we have in, in the um, chief human capital office and folks who you know, get, our, get our hiring ramped up again and do it uh, in new, smarter ways, how do we bring in lots of folks um, that are going to be highly qualified and get them where we need them is really important. And, and as he said also, I think the, um, the additional hiring flexibilities in the Advance Act are really, uh, would be really great, and we certainly appreciate that support as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're on. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Rickus. Thank you, Chairman Carper. Good to see you. Ranking Member uh, Capito. You know, I always say I love being on this committee. Well, we're not going to talk about ethanol today. <laughs> yeah, then, but uh, I want to. I would be. Mr. I'd be happy to join you in doing that. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, thank you, commissioners, for serving in this role and for being with us here today. Nebraska is very proud of our nuclear power that we have. That's clean, safe, and reliable. Our Cooper Nuclear Station is an 835 megawatt facility that can generate power for about 385,000 residences, even in the hottest part of summer. So we're, we're very um, proud of our nuclear power and look to continue to see how we can expand it going forward in the future. And uh, Chairman Hanson, this question is going to be for you, though. I'm going to start by actually quoting what Commissioner uh, Caputo said, which is the principles of good regulation state that the American taxpayer, the rate-paying uh, rate consumer, and licensees are all entitled to the best possible management and administration of regulatory activities. The highest technical and managerial competence is required and must be a constant agency goal, right? That's the NRC's practice or uh, stated goal there. However, in looking at uh, the review process here, there's uh, some questions I have about it, and I'll give you a little bit of background. As governor of Nebraska, we were very focused on process improvement and how we could streamline our operations to be able to do a better job. And uh, the NRC has, uh, I've been looking at the license time that it takes the licensing hours for the um, initial renewals, and it doesn't appear that you're living up to what the goal here is because it says 
the first 44 initial license renewals were completed in or around an average of 16,000 review hours. And most recently, review hours for initial license renewals have been estimated to be 23,000, an increase of 44%. And then another thing I'd like to address, Mr. Uh, or Chairman Hansen, is uh, in subsequent license renewal applications, which I would think, and granted, I'm a layman, so I don't know, I'm not an expert on this stuff, but you would think you'd be able to realize the efficiencies based upon the initial license renewal screening, safety, environmental review, as well as the, you know, ongoing management programs that they have, those have averaged 25,000. So for me, there's a disconnect between the initial licensing being shorter than the follow-on licensing. I would think that would be easier to do. So why have these subsequent license renewal reviews require more time and resources than the, the initial ones? And why is it taking longer just in general to do these initial license reviews? Uh, Senator, the those are very good questions. I've recently become aware of this discrepancy in the hours myself, and I am focusing on it and uh, working with the, the uh, career staff to find out kind of what the issues are here. Oftentimes, the way we'll approach these things is to look at the differences between uh, like things, you know, uh, it, you know, an initial license renewal for a particular reactor, and then the subsequent, okay, well, what's changed, and look and dive into those. So I'm. I don't have an answer for you today, but I will get back to you for the record on 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 what uh, what exactly is going on there. I can I can share my uh, concern about that as well, and I want to understand better uh, exactly what's going on there. Okay. Well, yeah, I appreciate you following up on that. Again, we leverage Lean Six Sigma. There's a lot of other process proven right. methodologies out there that you can implement agency wide to be able to drive you know, better productivity, uh, you know, streamlining operations, reducing the number of steps it takes to do things, and not sacrificing anything with regard to right. the quality of the output or anything like that. Yeah. And of course, I think, again, you're gonna find broad support for the nuclear industry, especially, uh, Commissioner Barron was talking about some of the exciting new technologies that are coming online. Nebraska has passed some laws to be able to uh, really try to attract that to our state when we're talking about some of these advanced nuclear uh, programs. So we're really excited about this stuff. Um, Okay, so uh, if you could get back to describing some of those things. I see I'm, I'm getting running close to the number of time, so I'm not going to go over because we also have some other people here. But uh, I, I do want to say if you can get back to us on that and then uh, just follow up on what, some of the steps you'll do there. And then another question, maybe you can, as long as you're doing that, in the Inflation Reduction Act, there's several provisions to incentivize uh, power up rates of the current fleet of power reactors. Can you provide your strategy for how you're going to address the potential increase in power upgrade applications for uh, in line with the Inflation Reduction Act? Yeah. Um, we haven't gotten formal notification yet from licensees about power upgrades, but we've had some informal interactions, and I know the Nuclear Energy Institute has a survey out there as well that, that folks are going to be pursuing those. And in our operating reactors group, we are um, already starting to look ahead for that and make sure that we've got the right skill sets in place. It's also part of our hiring strategy. I mentioned reactor systems analysts uh, earlier. Those are going to be some of the critical skill sets that we're going to need to be able to um, move those in a risk-informed and performance-based and timely way, you know, while keeping our safety mission uh, front and center. Now, you know, it seemed to me you can create a template for anybody who applies for the up rates about what they would have to do to be, and where they could get to go with regard to this. And again, this is something that I think is, as we have increasing energy demands, yeah. going to be something that's important for the, my state and the nation to be able to be able to accomplish. So we've I'm done that in other areas, Senator, where we've kind of gone through almost like a pilot th process with, with a single licensee that then other licensees can follow that pattern and it becomes more efficient over time. Great, fantastic. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Thank Chairman. You. Thanks for those uh, questions. Senator Cardin, you recognized. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me thank uh, all the commissioners for your work. We appreciate it very much. Uh, I'm proud of the, your your uh, location in our state of Maryland and um, and the workforce, uh, many of which live in Maryland. I, I want to talk about the workforce issues. I know it's been brought up. Uh, I, I want to mention three issues and then try to get your response on how you're dealing with it. The NRC has a higher than average attrition rate. You're, we have a problem of attrition generally in federal service, but your rates are higher than the norm. We have a morale problem on all the recent ratings uh, in regards to the best place to work. 
The NRC has dropped in its rating. I think it's 21st out of 27 right now. And according to OPM, uh, the Federal Employees Viewpoint Survey uh, dropped from 81.8 in 2010 to 66.5 in 2022. There is a morale issue problem at the uh, NRC. And then lastly, you have an age factor. One third of your workforce, as I understand it, is eligible for retirement. The number of workers that you have that are under the age of 30 is about 4%, if my numbers are correct. So what steps are you taking in an effort to try to reverse these three trends? The attrition, the uh, age of the workforce, and the spirit of the workforce to work under difficult circumstances because it's a good place to work. Senator, thank you. Um, let me try and uh, tackle each, each one of those uh, if I can. You're right, attrition uh, has uh, gone up. I think we last year we got up to about 9%, which is, you're right, higher, um, uh, um, uh, higher than normal. I would say in terms of the age, age factor there, we, um, the average age of new hires into the agency is about uh, between 36 and 39. So we are, the folks that we're bringing in are significantly younger than a lot of the other um, uh, folks in the agency. We're also focused on, on uh, knowledge management. So, uh, and this commission has been focused on it as well, so that the, the knowledge and the expertise of some of those older workers who are eligible to retire and will retire is getting transferred down so that we can continue to keep um, our safety mission uh, front and center. And then finally, in terms of the, the, um, our FEV scores, uh, you know, I acknowledge those. You know, 10 years ago or so, we were number one in FEVs, the best place to work in government. We were also growing a lot. There was a lot of promotion potential. We were looking at the nuclear renaissance. We were 25, 30% bigger than we are now. And we've shrunk a lot. And as, um, and as we got, and, and as the agency shrunk and we weren't sure about the future of nuclear, well, the nuclear for energy and climate security reasons really picked up. And then, the, but at that same time, the pandemic hit. Uh, and folks were uh, 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 forced to go home. And, and now we're in a hybrid work environment. And the key to really making that environment work, I think, is, is really about trust and about getting, um, making uh, the staff know that we trust them to do a good job, that we trust them to uh, come into the office when they need to, um, that we trust them to accomplish the mission. And that's, that's really the theme throughout this. Before the pandemic, we were accomplishing the mission. Um, during the pandemic, we accomplished mission, and we're accomplishing it now, and um, and we're going to continue to do so going forward. And helping folks understand the importance of that mission, um, uh, this dynamic time that I think each of my colleagues talked about uh, is really important, and I hope can be a morale booster uh, going forward. I'm a strong supporter of your workforce, and I will continue to be a strong supporter for what you need. The challenges you're talking about have been confronted by many agencies in government. Uh, we've, we've seen a decline in uh, many of our agencies. Your relative score is dropping, and your absolute score has dropped pretty dramatically. Uh, you need a strategy, and I, the building blocks you just mentioned are very important points, and, I, and that has got to be a key part but it needs to be first acknowledged that you have a problem. You then need to work with the workforce to find out the reasons for what is happening here and then have a strategy so that people want to work for your agency and that you can attract the young people that are going to be necessary to give you the continuity in a field that's very dynamic. So uh, this is an area that is just absolutely essential in recruitment and if you have a reputation that's not a good place to work, it's going to make it even more difficult for you to get the talent you need to meet the missions in the future. So I, I just would hope that you would share with us a strategy to take this issue on head on with the workforce. So it's not dictating how they should feel, but understanding how they feel and then deal with the challenges that you have moving forward. I'm happy to provide more details uh... Uh, on, on some of the things we're doing in that area, Senator. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Thanks for those, uh, those comments, uh, Senator Cardin. We've been joined by Senator Lummis, uh, and then uh, uh, Senator Padilla, I think, is, no, Senator Whitehouse slipped in here. Senator Whitehouse, good morning. All right, uh, uh, Senator, uh, Senator Lummis, good morning. How are you? 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, welcome. Thank you for being here, commissioners. Um, in Wyoming, you know, we're really looking forward to uh, the advanced reactors like Terra Power's natrium reactor coming to Kemmerer, Wyoming. So uh, much to be excited about. Um, Chairman Hansen, for agreement states like Wyoming, would it be possible for states to do early site permitting to grease the wheels for future reactors in communities that want them? And, and would that require agreement amendments, or is this allowed under current NRC regulations? Um, Senator, I'd have to get back to you with the specifics on that. I think the NRC retains authority for early site permits for reactors, but, uh, and, and so um, I think under the Atomic Energy Act, that's not eligible for um, uh, agreement state, but, but as part of the early site permit process, we would work with and consult uh, state and other and other parties uh, throughout that. Uh, great. I'll look forward to following up with you on please. that. That'll Absolutely. be great. Senator, yeah. if I may. Yes. If I may. Yes. Um, our, under our uh, regulations, any individual can pursue an ESP, and that definition of individual does, in fact, include states and state entities. Okay. So it would be possible for the state or well, as an agreement state, to pursue an early site permit. Generally, there's a requirement to have control over the land, so there would need to be some sort of an agreement, either possession of the property in question or some sort of an agreement with the owner okay. that would allow um, the work and site characterization necessary to achieve a permit to go forward. And there are precedents for that. I believe uh, the reactor vendor, Oklo, has some sort of an agreement like that uh, with the DOE site at Idaho National Lab. Okay. But it is possible for a state to proceed and actually pursue an early site permit. Well, thank you for that answer. And also, thank you for coming to Wyoming uh, and looking at uh, some of the in situ recovery sites in Wyoming. Well, that's always my pleasure. Yeah, well, it's, and my staff really enjoyed spending time with you. And for anybody who hasn't seen it, it's always such a surprise. It was the first time I saw in situ because we're used to visualizing a typical mining operation. You go see an in situ operation, it's like you're going out and watch, looking at a bunch of beehives. Uh, it, it, it is very low profile on the surface, and there's no surface disturbance that you can see. It's absolutely amazing. So uh, for anyone who hasn't seen it, we'd love to have you out and show it to you further. Um, I want to talk a little bit about remediation of legacy uranium sites. Um, I know that the commissions had numerous public statements uh, supporting remediation. Um, uh, members of this committee also share that goal, especially given the development of technology that can finally clean up the roughly 15,000 waste rock piles in the West. Uh, one of the technologies that's used is called high-pressure slurry ablation, or HIPSA. I'm sure you know that. It was a new term to me. Um, but one of those uh, technologies, which is basically a car wash for rocks, uh, was recently declined a multi-site license by the NRC staff. Uh, you recently directed staff to reconsider and present options to the commission. Um, I'm, and my question is, who sets the policy for the NRC? Is it the NRC staff or is it the commissioners? And uh, yeah, who, uh, who would like Senator, to answer? The, the policy matters re reside with the commission. And so um, that was one of the reasons why we directed the staff. Uh, co uh, Commissioner Barron was actively involved in this uh, uh, issue to provide us a paper with options and policy implications uh, on this matter. Um, because there were, some, there were some issues about legal authority and definitions in the statute, et cetera. We wanted to better fully understand that and fully understand what our, what our options were. Um, may I ask you then, uh, Commissioner uh, Barron, um, does the commission believe it has the authority to revise its own interpretation of byproduct materials to exclude beneficial remediation technologies from being considered milling? It seems like that word milling has 
uh, come into question in all of this? Yeah, we, we need uh, to regulate remediation technologies in a way that makes sense. And um, as a matter of policy, I think we want to incentivize uh, the remediation, the cleaning up of mine waste. We, we obviously need to comply with the Atomic Energy Act, and that's kind of the issue with these definitions. But I'm not convinced that the statute requires us uh, to apply a regulatory framework here that wouldn't make sense or doesn't fit. So um, I know you have legislation that looks at this, um, and I think that would be very good legislation. I don't think Congress should need to act in this area. Um, I think the commission has um, the latitude to develop a more appropriate policy. We've directed the NRC staff to think creatively about this and, and provide us with some viable options. Thank you. Thanks very much for being here. Um, May Senator, I, uh, yes, Senator, please. this was one of the technologies that I was able to visit last week in Wyoming, and I agree with the chairman and, and Commissioner Barron. It it's difficult under the um, under the initial legal review by uh, by our Office of General Counsel. It's difficult to envision any remediation technology not falling under that interpretation for milling, um, which would necessitate functionally a milling license for cleanup of each and every uranium remediation site that's out there, and there are thousands. So I do believe that there's room to um, look at this and, and perhaps get a fresher legal uh, interpretation that would enable remediation. Thank you very much. Commissioners, thanks so much for being here. Appreciate your, your testimony today. I yield back. Thank you. You bet. Uh, Senator Whitehurst and then Senator Padilla. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Chair Hansen and members of the commission, welcome, particularly welcome to Commissioner Crowell, who is returning to this committee from uh, his position here uh, years ago. Um, the legislative status is that we got you both the Nuclear Energy Innovation Capabilities Act and the Nuclear Innovation and Modernization Act, um, and we have pending um, Senator Capito's uh, Advance Act, which um, I have been helpful and supportive with, and I, I think I'm her, one of her Democratic co-sponsors, if not her lead one. Um, and I would like to know, um, with respect to speeding up the pace of approval for new sort of fourth generation technologies, are you satisfied with the authorities that we gave you, or is there something more that you need? And I invite you, since there are five of you, to make that a question for the record and just let us know, are those two bills adequate? What more do you need? Because the Advance Act is filed, but it can still be amended. And if there's more that you need, we could consider putting other things that you think would be helpful into the Advance Act. So I'd like to get your uh, official views on that as individual chair and commissioners. And the second uh, issue I want to raise with you is one that I raise pretty much every time, which is my worry that by relying uh, so much on private sector initiative, we rely enormously on economic signaling and we could be in a situation in which um, two technologies, one which use, requires new fuel, and another technology which would allow the reuse and reprocessing of spent fuel of our existing nuclear waste stockpiles, um, that the spent fuel technology will fail the economic test because it'll be cheaper to get new fuel and that economic test will not have taken into consideration the very important national security and public safety values of finding out what we can do to make use of our spent fuel. I'm worried that that becomes a mistake because the economic signals are poorly aligned. In the same way that we saw safely operating nuclear plants shut down so that natural gas plants could light up, only because the natural gas plants were cheap, so-called cheaper, only because they were polluting for free, and the nuclear plants got zero value for being pollution-free, um, you could end up with decision-making that is 
driven by false economics. So what more can we do? We establish a prize in our bill to encourage that form of uh, reuse of spent fuel in new technologies. Beyond having a prize, what more can we do to make sure that the value of figuring out how to use spent fuel gets baked into your preferences, even if it doesn't flow through into the narrow cost-benefit analysis of the actual um, operator. Yeah. Senator, thank you. Um, and again, oh. time, will, time will run out. Happy to have the chair lead off. And um, if anybody doesn't have a chance to answer, then it's a question for the record, because you've got one minute. Chair Hansen. OK. I, from a regulatory perspective, I think the opening stakes here are that, we are, um, that we're actively engaged with folks that are pursuing um, uh, reprocessing technologies so that we don't, we're not an impediment and that we make sure that our regulations can ensure safety, but that they're clear and transparent and efficient in that regard. So I think we can have some influence on the economics. We talked about economic signals. Uh, you talked about economic signals yep. and that being kind of important there. I'll, I'll hand it off yep. to Commissioner yep. Caputo. Or I Commissioner think there's Ryan. a real danger of, of misaligned economic signals because the value of getting into that nuclear waste stockpile and figuring out better more productive uses for it is not one that accrues to the operator. And so we've got to make sure you are pushing in that direction firmly to overcome that built-in economic disincentive. Well, Senator, I, I would just like to say that my first position out of school was, in fact, working in fuel procurement. And the difference between the market price for uranium and reprocessed uranium was the difference between roughly $10 and several hundred dollars a pound. Uh, but there are advanced reactor technologies out there that are looking at how to include some means of recycling in terms of um, how they use fuel and how they use the reactor. And so with these other technologies, in combination with an advanced reactor design, I think there are opportunities there that may propel um, a different value chain uh, to make that decision uh, more economically competitive. And I don't think those technologies have come before us yet in terms of requesting review for um, a processing facility. Uh, but I do think that there's potential there for improved economics and, um, and proliferation resistance with some of these uh, recycling technologies. Good. Well, it's not exactly entirely last call at the old Advance Act saloon um, because it's just been... <laughs> It's just been uh, filed, but we are going to try to move it. And the sooner you can get to us any advice on what we can do in addition to the prize in that bill to encourage utilization of spent fuel, we would love to hear from you to try to make our own judgment about the wisdom of putting that into the bill. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, thanks very much for raising uh, those points. Very uh, timely and uh, on, on, on target. Um, well, with much appreciation to our ranking member, who is so essential to it. You bet. Um, Senator uh, Markey, are, are, are you uh, in need of, of uh, permission from uh, Senator Padilla to go ahead of him in, in line? You, are you in a rush? Uh, if, uh, if you are, just. If you don't mind, Senator Padilla. All right, yeah. thanks. Thank Senator Padilla, thank you for that. Senator Markey. Thank you. Um, in December of 2021, Holtec, the company in charge of decommissioning the Pilgrim nuclear power station, announced that it planned to discharge approximately one million gallons of radioactive wastewater into Cape Cod Bay. This news was met with concerns and questions from nearby families, fishermen, business leaders, and state and local elected officials who are worried about how such a large discharge of radioactive wastewater could affect public health, marine species, and the region's economic engines, including tourism and fishing. Given these understandable concerns, local residents and businesses called for an independent expert analysis of the proposed discharge. Chairman Hansen, is it true that effluent testing and analysis are generally considered legitimate decommissioning activities that can be paid for by a nuclear decommissioning trust fund as long as expenditures would not reduce the value of the trust below an amount necessary to maintain the reactor in safe storage condition and ultimately release the site uh, and terminate the license. Yeah. As long as there are sufficient funds to conduct the decommissioning safely, then yes, those activities could be withdrawn from the decommissioning trust fund. 
Yeah, thank you. That's well, my understanding. For decades, ratepayers paid into Pilgrim's decommissioning trust fund to support the decommissioning process. And now they are demanding independent answers about the risk of Holtec's proposed discharge. Holtec's refusal to fund this robust independent study has violated its commitment to our communities to ensure <coughs> an open and transparent decommissioning process. And while we're on the topic of eligible expenses for decommissioning trust funds, I would also like to express my concern over the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's reconsideration of an industry request to use decommissioning trust funds to pay for the maintenance of nuclear power plants that are still operating. Allowing licensees to use decommissioning trust funds to pay for major radioactive components disposal during plant operations is completely out of line with NRC regulations. Decommissioning trust funds are only authorized to be used for radiological decommissioning, not ongoing plant operations and maintenance. So Chairman Hansen, is it true that in 2021, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission denied a petition to change the decommissioning funding assurance regulation for that purpose? We did, de we did decline to pursue a rulemaking in that area, yes, Senator. Well, I would strongly discourage the Nuclear Regulatory Commission from reopening that decision. It was the correct decision. And I would encourage the Commission not to bend the rules on decommissioning trust funds and funding uh, assurance. I think that we should keep a very bright line. Uh, nuclear plant operators shouldn't be pilfering funds uh, reserve for decommissioning of the plant to protect their profits during operation. Uh, that is just two separate categories altogether, and it is just wrong. Uh, in the latest version of the proposed decommissioning rule, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission would have no ability to approve, change, or deny plants decommissioning proposals known as post <coughs> excuse me, post-shutdown decommissioning activity reports based on their content and feasibility. The NRC would simply acknowledge receipt and look at whether these critical reports check the boxes for complete. Chairman Hansen, is it true that under this rulemaking, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission just checks to make sure all the necessary parts of the shutdown and decommissioning plan are in the report? without having to formally approve the plan. Uh, Senator, that's the approach in the proposed rule. Uh, we, as, uh, um, we've gotten a lot of comments in this area. Uh, I appreciated the opportunity to speak with you about this issue in your office. I uh, think we had a, um, uh, a, a very substantive conversation about this. And um, what I took away was the, from our conversation was the importance of providing uh, the public an opportunity to weigh in at the beginning of the decommissioning process. And whether that's through the PSDAR or something else, uh, I understand the staff is, is taking into account those comments along the lines, those that you submitted and others uh, uh, at this area about the best way uh, uh, or a number of options uh, for doing that. Well, my feeling is that it's like having a mechanic that checks to make sure you have all four tires on your car and tells you you're good to go without having to check to make sure those tires don't have a hole in them. It's a policy designed ultimately for a crash. So Chairman Hansen, if the NRC had to formally approve the decommissioning activities report, would it be considered a major federal action that would require a new National Environmental Policy Act review? Um. I, I'm sorry, Senator, I'll have to get back to you on the specifics of that for the record. Um, well, I, I, I hope the answer is uh, yes, um, although companies have to certify their belief that the decommissioning activities are bounded by previous NEPA reviews. Uh, I would conclude that that was, uh, right. that was the uh, correct position. Yeah. And Chairman Hansen, uh, if the NRC had to formally approve de uh, decommissioning activities report, would that provide an opportunity for stakeholders to challenge the activities outlined in the report through an adjudicatory hearing. Uh, yes, if we had to approve that, that would be an action in which uh, the public could 
challenge that or intervene in that process? Yeah, well, so it makes a lot more sense to me to conduct an environmental review and give the public an opportunity to weigh in before the decommissioning process begins. Otherwise, you get situations like we have in Massachusetts, a potential boondoggle where nearby communities are feeling unheard and under threat by nuclear power plant operators. As I've expressed to you on multiple occasions, I sincerely hope the commission requires the NRC to approve post-shutdown decommissioning activity reports in the decommissioning rulemaking. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you're welcome. And uh, Senator Th Padilla, thank you for uh, yielding so that uh, Mr. Markey could ask those questions. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we've heard about Massachusetts. Let's talk about California. <laughs> you know, California is very proud of the recent scientific breakthrough at the National Ignition Facility at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. I particularly want to recognize Livermore's director, uh, Kim Budil, and her team who made history for achieving fusion ignition and unlocking, Mr. Chairman, this new milestone for the future of clean energy. Uh, now, last week, the NRC voted unanimously to create a new regulatory pathway for fusion energy separate and apart from the existing framework around fission energy. So, uh, Mr. Chair, we'll just go straight to the top. Can you describe how the separate regulatory pathway will provide the certainty needed to ensure the uh, uh, fusion energy can continue to advance in the years ahead? Excuse me. Thank you, Senator. I'm, uh, I'm really looking forward. I have a, a planned trip to Livermore and, and uh, know uh, Dr. Badil uh, fairly well and look forward to catching up and seeing that facility again uh, in June. Um, so by establishing this in a what we call a byproduct material framework, it really recognizes the fact that there's not that and there's not the risk associated with an, with an ongoing fusion reaction that oftentimes with these facilities, um, if you have a loss of power event, the plasma just dissipates, and that there's actually a relatively low inventory of nuclear material, oftentimes deuterium or tritium, something that poses much less risk uh, to workers and the public than, say, a, um, uh, uh, a typical fission reactor, although those operate safely, of course, as well. Um, so by doing that and by saying that we can regulate the materials involved or like a particle accelerator, say, used in a research facility or a hospital, then that provides the certainty um, uh, and the knowledge of de uh, technology developers that they will be then kind of outside of a lot of the big power reactor type requirements, that the focus really will be on the materials uh, used in those uh, things as well and hopefully then allows that technology to you know, develop and reach commercial scale, and we can satisfy our, our safety requirements. All in the next three weeks. All in the next three weeks. You got it. <laughs> that was a joke for people <laughs> watching at home. Uh, on a serious note, though, can you describe the level of resources you'll need to adequately support this new pathway? And obviously, if additional support from Congress is necessary, please uh, articulate that as well. Oh, thank you. Uh, no, we have the resources we need. That was incorporated into our FY24 budget request. We have some resources in 23 to get started on this. Wonderful. Of course, as you noted, the commission just gave the staff direction, so they're going to get rolling here in pretty short order. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, another topic, also California-specific, uh, not sorry. Uh, as you all know, there's been several recent developments surrounding Diablo Canyon, uh, the, so the nuclear plant in California. Uh, this includes dual tracking the process of relicensing and decommissioning. Uh, and the NRC's recent determination to allow Diablo Canyon to keep operating under its current license as uh, PG&E seeks full approval to extend its lifespan. Uh, Mr. Chair, given your previous work on this side of the dais, you're well aware of the strong feelings that many people in California have about Diablo Canyon. Can you discuss your view of the recent events uh, surrounding Diablo Canyon and, and I guess more specifically how the NRC will continue to maintain safety standards at the facility. Um, thank you, uh, Senator. We're gonna continue to uh, 
conduct our normal inspection activities. In fact, we're, we've got a, a series, I believe, of, of special inspections going into the fall that may normally happen after someone had submitted a license renewal application, but because of the timing of that, we're gonna move, you know, those are gonna get moved up a little bit. And, and of course, we'll do that in kind of fuel, full and open view uh, of the public, uh, as we always do. We're also gonna be participating in the public meeting out at Diablo Canyon on May 3rd. Our staff will be there uh, to talk to the public about that license renewal process process and what that means and how we're going to continue our oversight activities during that process. And uh, just in, in the same spirit, but more specific, not just maintaining safety standards more broadly, but continue to be operationally safe and spe with specific uh, uh, concern about seismic risk, which we've talked about for years here, mm -hmm. uh, and, and maintaining that. Any comments here would be helpful. Uh, it's also a friendly reminder to anticipate that when you do have these uh, public hearings. Yeah, of, co of course. Um, we, you know, we're going to be looking at updated safety information as part of that license renewal process. We did require all plants to take a look at the uh, enhance, you know, relook at their risks after Fukushima. Diablo, of course, did look at their seismic risk again, and we'll take another look at that as part of the license renewal process. And we also have a process. Um, of, it's it's the process on natural hazards information, basically. It's kind of an ongoing um, information gathering on external hazards to plants where we um, uh, look at that in conjunction with the licensee about maybe, uh, you know, any changing conditions at the plant with regard to external hazards to make sure we're incorporating that into our safety bases. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thanks a lot very much for joining us today and for your comments. Senator Capito. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner Wright, I remember when you came before the committee, you said your mother was watching remotely, so in case she's watching, I wanted to make sure you, you, you got a good question. Uh, <laughs> um, the, the bill that we've been talking about, the advance bill that uh, Senator Whitehouse, Senator Carper, and I are on, among others, directs the NRC to consider options to enable the timely licenses of nu nuclear facilities at brownfield sites. This is where our state of West Virginia, I think, uh, uh, could really have, um, have some interesting prospects for retired conventional energy facilities. Um, first of all, are you aware of that in the Advance Act? And, and what kind, can you give some examples at what uh, states would be looking at if they were looking at retired um, power plants that might be uh, perfect sites for, uh, for, for these kinds of developments? Senator, thank you for the question, <clears throat> and thank you for uh, saying hello to mom. <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, uh, I, I'm, I hope she's watching. The, uh, so it's a real interesting time, and, and uh, West Virginia is, you know, trying to be a leader here and, and looking at brownfield sites to, to put these plants at, right? There's, there are some concerns and that we need that the NRC needs to really take a hard look at to be sure, because if you're putting multiple units at one site, um, I, I, I would like to be sure that, the, and, and the, would be encouraging staff to look at whether or not an EIS is required for each one of these things, mm -hmm. right? Because that would, I don't, I, I don't understand that that, or I don't think that would be necessary. That might be a little bit of overkill. Um, but, you know, from a, from a prudency standpoint, from a state regulator uh, kind of perspective, they're going to be looking at things that are a benefit to the ratepayer in the end, right? Uh, you've got access to transmission. You've got a site that's already right. been uh, used before. So those are benefits to the ratepayers in the state. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, you know, whatever these uses are going to be for, for these different reactors could have additional benefits, right, depending on whether you're in a vertically integrated state or uh, a market state. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Rao Crow, do you have a comment on that? Thank you, Rick. Um, Senator Capito. I think the other thing that the NRC could do uh, well to prepare for the eventuality of using brownfield sites is to start working now with the EPA to sort out where the jurisdictional lines are and the liabilities so that we can move quickly uh, for approving reuse of such a site um, if we receive an application to, to do so. Um, I, I don't think we want it to get stuck um, in an endless process of whose jurisdiction is whose um, because the idea of reusing these sites is for expediency, 
So right. No, I think that's yeah. an excellent yeah. point. I, I think we run into this in other kinds of permitting when there's overlapping jurisdiction, or not even overlapping, but maybe new jurisdictions that are unsure where one ends and where where, where the other begins. So uh, I would encourage the commission and the staff to begin those conversations because that's the vision that I think us and other states probably have in terms of being able to be a player here to be able to use this development. Um, thank you. Um, Chairman Hansen, just one last question, a slight beef here, uh, that we had written a letter um, to you uh, on the uh, draft rule, or not the, the final rule, establishing the emergency preparedness requirements encouraging you all to make the decision. And you're, you know, we got five sentences back. It didn't really uh, uh, exude uh, enthusiasm for what we were trying to say or much information. So in the spirit of uh, independence, openness, effectiveness, and clarity, which are your principles of good regulations and reliability, we've also received some questions from uh, other um, um, state, in the stakeholder community where some of the, um, responses have been lacking. So I would just ask you to review that rule, role of openness to make sure that we're getting as good a communication as we possibly can. Yeah, Senator, I, I apologize for the paucity of that response. It's certainly not our intention uh, to um, uh, uh, um, provide the, those kinds of, of, of meager answers. Um, uh, certainly, uh, it's my intention uh, in my interactions with the staff, and I know my commissioners share this to, to share all the available information with Thank the you. committee and with you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Kemper. And thank you again for your leadership on uh, our new legislation. I'm happy to be uh, uh, advanced. Uh, I think it's uh, well, well uh, titled, and I'm excited about uh, working with you and Senator Whitehouse and others on, uh, on his passage. We've been joined by Senator Sullivan, and I'm going to yield to him for his questions. Welcome. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Appreciate the uh, commissioners all being here. Uh, my state, the great state of Alaska, has a very diverse energy portfolio. All of the above energy, oil, natural gas, coal, renewables, hydro, wind, solar. But one thing is missing from the mix in Alaska, and that's nuclear energy. And despite our uh, very incredible natural resources for Alaska, America, the world, we have the second highest electricity costs in the country, 20 cents per kilowatt hour. Average in the US is 11. And we have 190 rural communities in my state that do not have access to the power grid. 250 communities that are not connected by a road. We're very unique, my colleagues here hear this from me about every damn day. <laughs> um, so almost all those communities use power generation through diesel generators. So uh, we're very interested in the process for micro reactors, which we think has a lot of potential. Our governor recently signed uh, into legislation a law that would help streamline the approval process for micro reactors in Alaska rural communities. But the big dog in terms of approval for any kind of nuclear reactions is all of you. So I'm just really going to ask an open question that relates to the promise of micro reactors for rural communities, but more prominently, and I know Senator Capito is really working hard on this, which is great. Um, we have this amazing potential resource. It is a great resource we use. But as you all know, because you're right in the middle of it, the permitting process by which to bring more nuclear power online, whether large scale or micro, is very, very time consuming, cumbersome. And um, I think it's discouraging in order to enable capital investments and capital formation that's needed to back these kind of projects or innovations. So my question to all the commissioners, commissioners is, what should we do about it? How can we address it? Micro, broader, just a very open-ended question. I'm always about trying to get more efficient, timely permitting 
for anything in America. It's really an Achilles heel for our country. And uh, we need to do more, especially in your area. So I'll start with any and every yes, Commissioner. Well, Senator, I'd just like to make the observation this isn't the first time that Alaska has looked at microreactors. Um, certainly when I first started working in the House uh, for the Energy and Commerce Committee on Energy Policy Act of 2005, there was a lot of interest in Galena, Alaska, yeah. in a microreactor design. Correct. Um, I think that basically just ahead of its time, a lot more designs are out there now. I think and by the way, fair... Allison Air Force Base has <laughs> requested a proposal to construct a 2.5 megawatt micro reactor. So we're kind of back to the future. Indeed. That's happening right now. Yes. I think there's a fair amount of com uh, competition in this area and a range of designs. Um, I do think it's really incumbent upon us as the regulator to look at ways to create more regulatory predict predictability. Yeah. There are a lot of issues and, and requirements in our regulations that really, I think, shouldn't apply when you get down to that scale. Should not. Right. Right. So that's the big question. It's not one size fits all. So the exactly. Old. The challenge, I think, comes from the fact that some of these technologies are different and they will need different sets of exemptions, which means it becomes an open question which of our which of our requirements will apply and which won't. So I think we need to do a lot more to create clarity in um, in the applicability of our regulations so that applicants know exactly what they need to include in their applications so that they can have more predictable and timely decisions. Good. Great. Anyone else? I would love just any commissioner. I, yes, sir. S Senator, I think the key piece of this as well, in addition to some of the clarity and, and predictability around this, which I completely agree about, is uh, the standardization. So maybe we do a uh, a detailed look on the safety of the first one of these, but the next of those, if they're if they're the same and and the deployment is the same, then that becomes a pretty routine and very very uh, quick and efficient uh, exercise. So the standardization on the part of vendors and designers, I think, will be critical. Is that happening? Well. Yeah, we're starting to we are starting to see that. We're we're making progress, I think, on both fronts. There are some bright spots there. Great. Anyone else has a thought? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much, um, Senator. You know, in my opinion, we're supposed to uh, enable the safe use of the nuclear technologies, not to inhibit it or discourage it. Right. So um, I, I agree with Commissioner Caputo and, and, and my colleague, uh, uh, Chair Hansen, that we, we've got to take a really hard look at the efficiency of what we're trying to do and make it a more efficient process. And there are things that the staff is looking at to do that, and I know that the uh, uh, that the vendors and people who are looking at these technologies are certainly encouraging us uh, to meet that moment. Great. Good. Good. Any, anyone else? Well, I, I, agree with, oh, I, I agree with what all my colleagues said. And, um, you know, there are, we're getting this framework in place, right? We need to have a framework that's going to be effective and efficient, not just for 1,000 megawatt reactors, but for one or two or 10 megawatt reactors, yeah. micro reactors. And it's, it's tricky, and, the, and a lot of work's gone into that, and we have a lot more work to do on that big kind of, um, rulemaking, the Part 53 rulemaking, but a lot of our first movers that were are likely to move on advanced reactors and small modular reactors, they're going to be using the existing regulations. And that's, you know, we call it Part 50 and Part 52. And we have other efforts underway to optimize those because we know those are going to be the regulations people use first. Part 53, we need to get right. It's critical. Part 50 and 52 have to work, too, um, for the new designs, and, and we're on that as well. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you. I uh, just as an aside, uh, a, lot, a number of years ago, I was visiting uh, my old the Naval Air Station, Moffett Field, out in California, and uh, stumbled on a, a reused uh, a, a, a building there. It used to be the hobby shop on the base, and it was uh, being uh, used for uh, research on the energy project for creating, creating uh, energy on Mars. And out of that came uh, a technology which involves creates uh, something called bloom boxes that use uh, fuel cells and able to uh, operate at uh, widely d divergent uh, temperatures. And uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, make sure that somebody from Bloom Energy reaches out to your office and to, just to explore and see if there's some, something that could, could be yeah. there. No, I'm a huge fan of Bloom Energy and the uh, CEO there and... They did their first experimentation on their big technology actually in Alaska. So they have an Alaska connection. Senator Stevens was very helpful with those guys. And so, yeah, I think their combination of technology, natural gas, 
coming together to produce electricity that's very low emission is very, it's outstanding. Good. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Uh, I uh, was asking a, a question uh, earlier in the uh, the hearing, and I, I think I, I, I called on, uh, I'm going to say Commissioner Barron, to respond to the question. I said we'd come back and, uh, and pose the same question for other members. I'm going to uh, re mention again that question. I'm going to ask you to the other members to respond for the record. And then I have some other questions I'll ask you to respond to uh, right here. But the question I ask uh, uh, Commissioner Barron to respond to is, would, uh, would uh, you please take a moment to describe how uh, easing these corporate support res uh, restraints will support the NRC's efforts to, to modernize and hire the highly skilled workers needed to carry out the NRC's important work now and into the future? And again, for the other members, uh, the other members of the commission, I'll ask you to respond to that as he's, um, Mr. Barron's already responded to it uh, verbally. Um, I, um, let's see. We could come back, uh, if I could, to Chairman Hansen and the, uh, uh, on, um, we've had some discussion already on fusion. I want to come back and, and re revisit a little bit and ask, ask you to, re to respond in this. Um, I think I'm, I speak for a lot of my colleagues. I'm excited. Uh, and uh, God knows uh, Senator from Cal California who was here with us earlier is excited uh, about the potential for nuclear fusion to provide safe, uh, clean, reliable energy to power our cities and, uh, and our industries. And uh, that's uh, one of the reasons why I'm encouraged to see the Commission's unanimous decision on the fusion regulation, which appears to balance safety on the one hand while providing a path for the deployment of fusion uh, energy systems. And my, my question, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, would be uh, what uh, resources uh, does the NRC need to both establish the basic rules of the road for a commercial uh, fusion applications that are anticipated within the coming years. And while uh, also laying the foundation for the long-term regulation of fusion energy systems. Senator, thank you. We have the resources we need in the FY24 budget or we're requesting the resources we need. I can get you the specific number for the record uh, on what, what those resources are. Um, and, and we're able to leverage some resources here in, in fiscal year 23 as well to get rolling on that regulatory framework. And I would expect there'll be a lot of public interaction as well. And the, both the commission and the staff will be working and communicating with both industry and the Department of Energy on technological developments to kind of understand and make sure that we've got that, as, that framework in place in a time that is, um, uh, uh, conducive um, for technology deployment. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. I think I, I misspoke uh, when I uh, said I was going to ask some of you to uh, respond for the, uh, for the record. And the, the question that uh, I, uh, I'd ask uh, 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 Commissioner Barron to respond to would be to ask you, you all to take a, a moment to, uh, to tell us how the new regulatory framework development process is going and how, uh, what is going well, what's going on issues of concern. He responded uh, in person. I'm going to ask the rest of you to respond for the record. I have uh, two more questions, and uh, then we're going to wrap it up uh, so I can go to the Finance Committee and ask questions there, and, and we have a vote underway, so it's quite a bit going on. Um, Again, I'm excited that you're here. And it's, it's great to, to see you here. And it's, I think I hope it's an exciting time for the folks who work uh, at, the, at the NRC. I, I think the, it's definitely a, um, a glass half full, maybe more than half full. Uh, uh, this question, if I could, for Commissioner Barron, Commissioner Kroll. Um, Commissioner Barron, Commissioner Kroll, looking at the budget for fiscal year 2024, would you like to highlight for us any investments that you say is particularly important or noteworthy? Well, I, I just point to a couple, um, and Brad may have others. I, I would point to the investments throughout the budget request on recruitment, retention, and hiring. We talked a lot about that today. It's really critical um, for, for the work we need to do you know, now and in the coming years. We 
doing a lot more hiring than we used to just to kind of break even with staffing. And those investments, I think, are very important. And the other thing I would note is we've talked a lot today about um, new reactor designs, new reactor applications. This is a, a budget request where you start to see those showing up. You know, that it's, it's uh, requests to perform technical reviews on a number of designs, construction permits, uh, combined license applications that are expected. So it's, it starts to get real, I think, in this budget, um, that kind of uh, anticipation that we've been talking about. All right, thank you. Commissioner Crow, same question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. While agreeing with Commissioner Barron's response, I would also highlight uh, something in the budget, which is specific to the uh, Minority Serving Institutions Grant Program, um, which is part and parcel to the future of the workforce at the NRC. I think the more we can do in the space of um, <clears throat> promoting uh, uh, you know, the, the upcoming generation to be in the fields that are important to the NRC is gonna serve our purpose as well. And so um, that, that budget item is an important one for the NRC. All right, thank you. Um, we just ask uh, in, in closing, and for the uh, starting uh, with uh, with the chair, and then coming right down the line. Uh, any uh, any final uh, thoughts? Any anything else you want to share with us on the committee? Just briefly, any final thoughts, please? Yeah. The, uh, um, you'd like th to th say you. before we close. Thank you, Chairman Carper, for the opportunity to be here. I'd, I'd just like to highlight the NRC's international activities briefly and uh, how important they are both um, for the agency in terms of the things that we receive and our, with our counterparts around the world, but also the kinds of expertise that we're able to provide. Um, and I, I guess I'd highlight um, um, three uh, main countries very briefly. And the first is Poland, obviously. You know they uh, signed a, an agreement to, to buy a Westinghouse AP-1000. There were a lot of things that went into that deal. Um, but I would note the decade-long relationship that the NRC has had with the Polish regulator and the, how we've ramped up the intensity of that relationship to prepare them to um, safely license and oversee U.S. technology. Um, and we value that relationship a lot. And I guess the second one I highlight is Ukraine and appreciate the support the Senate has given both for Ukraine generally, but also for the NRC's activities to support our Ukrainian regulatory counterparts. I'm in active communication with them about the status and the safety status of those plants in Ukraine. And we are providing things, um, both technical uh, expertise, but also just some basic things like equipment and uh, uh, helping them keep their offices uh, staffed and with the lights on and so forth. And that's a, a great privilege for us to be able to support our, um, our uh, Ukrainian counterparts there. Yeah. So thank you very much. No, thank you. Every day I, I get up and I get dressed and I, I put a, a lapel pin here. Some of you can probably see it's our flag. It's the Ukrainian flag. And uh, my wife and I, uh, along with a lot of other Americans, are supporting our, our, their own uh, a modest uh, uh, means, uh, the folks in Ukraine. And I just uh, applaud the, the efforts that you're uh, doing there to, to, to be of support and encouragement to them. Uh, Mr. Barron. Well, just very briefly, and I know it's not a, a legislative hearing, but we talked a lot about the Bipartisan Advance Act today. Uh, and I just would close by saying I think there are some terrific provisions in that bill. Um, we talked about several of them, the, the easing corporate support um, restrictions, additional hiring flexibilities, the Brownfields program. I think those are all really um, beneficial. Another one that we didn't talk about at all today that I think is a really good provision is modernizing uh, the foreign ownership control and domination restrictions that have been on the books since the 50s when, um, you know, that's a provision there that really recognizes there's a global nuclear market today that wasn't there uh, back uh, when the Atomic Energy Act first um, was enacted. So I think that's another really kind of thoughtful and well-designed provision. So I, I, I just... Uh, say I think there's a lot of really good work that went into that bill and a lot of provisions that would be very beneficial. Good, thanks. Uh, Commissioner Wright, uh, if your mom missed the first question around the questions, she has and that second shot right here. So <laughs> go ahead, any, any closing thoughts you have, go ahead. Thank you so much. I, and one of the things I love about hearings with you is that you ask this question. So thank you for this. You, um, you know, it's really, to steal your line, just a second ago, it's an exciting time to be a safety regulator. Uh, and there's no place that I would rather be than right here, right now. Um, we've had an opportunity, the five of us, to meet the, a, a very special moment in, in time, not just here in the U.S., but to our allies around the world. Uh, doing things a certain way because that's the way we've always done them is not a recipe for success. Um, and, you know, myself, any person, much less an agency, we're not going to be able to grow if we continue to do things the way we've always done them. Um, now, having said that, safety is our mission. Yeah, that's our focus. Reasonable assurance of adequate protection is the standard. That's the floor and the ceiling. 
um, and our strike zone over home plate. So um, it's non-negotiable. How we do things, though, how we do things at every level should always be up for discussion and debate and, and ways to be innovative, novel, transformative, and to just be a better in improving effectiveness and efficiency um, and using our resources that we've been you know, trusted with. So thank you for your interest and your support and your help. No, my, my pleasure. Our pleasure. Thanks. Thanks for seeing it. Senator Caputo. I, sorry. Senator Caputo. Caputo. <laughs> <laughs> you've been, I would say, you've been called worse. <laughs> Sir, I have no such ambition. Go ahead. We'll leave that to Senator Caputo. Um, so I, I would just, I would like to add my thanks to, um, to Commissioner Wrights that um, it is wonderful how you asked this question at the end. And I would respond by, by, with two quotes. You can't manage what you don't measure and that people will meet expectations. We have a brilliant and dedicated staff at the NRC and they will strive to meet the goals set for them. I think we need to do a much better job of setting ambitious goals and using meaningful metrics to spur performance improvement. In 2008 and 2009, when the NRC was the best place to work, it was the start of the renaissance and the agency was executing a heavy workload with challenging schedules and a sense of urgency. I believe recognition of success is a strong contributor to job satisfaction, and I think demonstrating that we can achieve recognized success is the fastest path for us to improve our morale. So I would leave you with that thought. That's good. Thank you. You're prepared for that question. <laughs> yes, I was. Good. Where's your call? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for giving the most junior member of the commission the last word. Um, <laughs> I think, um, uh, you know, I'll reiterate what I said in my opening statement, which is, you know, as we sit here on what we all hope is a, you know, meaningful and lasting, uh, the precipice of a meaningful and lasting nuclear renaissance, the NRC really needs to double down on its efforts in public engagement and, and building public trust. And that needs to apply not just to the existing reactor fleet and advanced reactors, it needs to apply to all of the things that the NRC oversees, because if we're not... Uh, doing things well in the waste management and decommissioning and material space, we're not going to have the trust of the public to do all the other um, <clears throat> more high profile things that we talk about in these hearings. So I think the NRC needs to look at uh, how they can do engagement with the public and build that trust in a new way. Good. Thank, thank you for that. I will just uh, conclude by, by thanking each of you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank uh, you and each of our commissioners, uh, Commissioner uh, Barron, Commissioner Wright, uh, uh, Commissioner Caputo and Commissioner Kroll, we're grateful to you for your appearance today, for your preparation, your responses to our to our questions and uh, willingness to work forward on uh, this as we go forward. We uh, especially appreciate uh, your uh, your insight regarding the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's proposed budget uh, for the upcoming uh, fiscal year. A well-functioning nuclear uh, industry is critical for the future of our economy, and I think for the future of our planet. And I look uh, forward to continue, we look forward to continuing to work with you, your team, to ensure that this uh, future is realized and to ensure that the, uh, the NRC has the, uh, the, the, really the assets, the resources that you need to carry out your critical responsibilities. Um, uh, before we adjourn, some housekeeping senators will be uh, allowed to submit uh, questions uh, for the records through the close of business on uh, Wednesday, May the 3rd. We'll compile those questions. We'll send them to each of you, and we'll ask that you reply to uh, to those questions by Wednesday, May the uh, the seventeenth. As my uh, colleagues know, I uh, and our staffs know, uh, I like music a lot, and uh, I used to com promote concerts. Uh, first one at Ohio State when I was, gosh, twenty one years old, and my last one when I turned sixty four, and we had a great concert with the three best rock and roll bands in Delaware at the Queen Theater. And at the end of the evening, a thousand people sang "When I'm 64," which is a huge, uh, huge fun. I, heard, I, I was driving to. I'd go back and forth on the train uh, just about every day, and I'd ride to uh, drive, drive uh, uh, to the train uh, in uh, usually pretty early in the morning in Wilmington. And I, I'm always listening to music. It's, it's about a 10, 12 minute drive. And uh, the uh, interestingly enough, I heard a great song by Carly Simon. So I remember Carly Simon, whose husband was James Taylor. What a what a what a combination they uh, they they made. But there was a Carly Simon song called "Coming Round Again," 
that some of you have heard. I see people nodding in the audience. And I'm thinking that might be a, a, an appropriate theme song here for, uh, for this industry. I think uh, it's coming around again. And at a time when we see great uh, threats uh, to our climate, climate from uh, climate, the threat of climate uh, uh, crisis, uh, we need every uh, arrow in our uh, quiver uh, to, uh, to be there, to be available. And I think nuclear, uh, maybe this time may be coming around again and at a time when we really need that. So we want to make sure that we make the most of that and uh, we use, so we work uh, actively in other, uh, other uh, uh, ways uh, as well as we address uh, climate change. Last thing, I, I, whenever we talk about climate change, I always mention jobs, jobs, economic opportunity. And uh, the, uh, I don't care whether you're creating electric vehicles or you're deploying charging stations or whatever, there's a lot of economic opportunities and jobs creating come out of our, our climate change work. And uh, there's job uh, uh, and economic activity and job creation potential coming out of what we're talking about here today. And if we're smart, uh, we'll not only do the right thing for our planet, for the people who live here now, and we'll live here in the future, but we'll, we're going to make sure that uh, that the, the future generations have some jobs, some great jobs, and they'll flow from this activity. And I think uh, with that, I think our hearings adjourned. I want to thank our staffs for the work that you all have done in preparing us for this. And uh, we look forward to uh, driving off into a brighter future with all of you. With that, this hearing is adjourned. Thanks so much.